Okay, I guess we can uh, begin. Thanks everybody for for joining us uh, for this session with Raghu Rajan. Really appreciate it. Uh, Raghu is in his office at the Hoover Institution, if you can tell. Uh, we are thinking of doing something a hybrid, both in and out, but it turns out it's all out, all Zoom. So thank you for joining us. And Arvin, sorry you couldn't do it in person, but glad you're here. So uh, Raghu will talk about going the extra mile, distance lending and credit cycles, kind of a unique data set. Uh, he's a senior fellow at Hoover, a professor of finance at Chicago, and governor of the Reserve Bank of India not so long ago. So huge amount of experience from different parts of the world. And this is a, a great subject for us to be discussing. So we'll, you can use your mechanical hand and interrupt Raghu if you'd like, or use the chat function, uh, we'll call on you, but uh, there'll be time for questions and answers after the formal presentation too. So Raghu, thank you so much, uh, go ahead. Thanks John for having me. And uh, this is joint work with uh, Joao Granha and Christian Leutz. Um, so what are we really gonna talk about? Uh, the first is uh, an interesting pattern in the data. Uh, what we find is the distance between a small business borrower and its bank uh, moved up sharply before the global financial crisis and then collapsed as the crisis hit. Now, uh, you know, uh, small businesses are typically close to the banks they borrow from because these are really uh, very information intensive relationships. The bank uh, sort of has to monitor collateral, has to assess the uh, borrower's character. It's not a whole lot of formal records that are available for small and medium businesses. And, and so proximity is typically uh, what we see. But of course, uh, one of the things that's happened with the advent of new technologies, uh, especially communications technologies, is that we've seen that distance grow. This is something that Mitch Peterson and I uh, sort of saw in an earlier paper in, in the early 2000s. And what uh, this paper documents is that process by which the distance between a borrower and its bank uh, that increases over time. And at that time, we attributed it to, to technology. What we see here is an abrupt increase before the financial crisis, which seems to be more than technology. It's not clear that technology would have changed so much in the span of two or three years. And uh, it's not as if these loans are better loans. In fact, these loans are associated with higher loan losses. And interestingly, they're driven by loans made from banks in areas where banking is more or less competitive to borrowers in concentrated areas. So there's a particular pattern by which these distance loans are made from uh, competitive banking areas to uh, borrowers in areas where banking is relatively more concentrated, uh, you know, using the usual measures. What we also find is that this is not unique to small business loans. If it was unique to small business loans, the loan losses, uh, well, it, it's an interesting phenomenon, but it's localized. In fact, the cyclicality in distance is correlated with losses more generally. The banks that become more cyclical in their distance lending, um, you know, increasing distance just before the crisis are typically banks that also had more losses. Uh, their NPA levels, which are only a small amount is contributed by small business lending. The NPA levels are in the upper tail of NPAs and other measures of risk taking are also correlated uh, with this. So this is a proxy for more generalized risk taking. And the big question is why? And you know, there's a big debate and uh, this is why I was trying to sell this to John. Uh, and you know, this was way before John asked for the paper, but. Um, you know, there's a debate between uh, Ben Bernanke and John Taylor on whether the Fed was too slow. And, and John says maybe a faster pace of removing accommodation before the financial crisis uh, was appropriate, uh, certainly by some, some broad measures, including the Taylor rule. And, and what we show here is that, in fact, this risk taking, this, this search for distance happened as tightening started uh, 
uh, Ben often, uh, and I'm obviously putting words in his mouth here, which he may not intend, but often says it wasn't us. We were tightening uh, when the craziness happened. And I want to show that, in fact, uh, a measured pace of tightening may, in fact, exacerbate the kind of craziness that happened with the lending with this particular market. And, and broadly, since this is correlated with other forms of risk taking, it could also be correlated with what's happening in other markets. So effectively, uh, the micro explanation of the facts I'm going to put forward is interesting in its own right, because it, it tells you something about the process of transmission of monetary policy, but also shows how this can get differentiated across markets within the country. Simply raising rates doesn't mean everybody sits tight and doesn't make, uh, make more loans. It can actually reallocate loans in ways that uh, the central banker may not anticipate. So we're gonna have a role for the bank exercise of market power, I'll explain in more detail, and also bank of moral hazard. Uh, it turns out that what is happening in those competitive areas is they're attracting deposits much more than in the concentrated areas, and they're recycling these deposits into loans into those concentrated areas. And that's where the distance increases, and that's what the, where the trouble also comes. So, so this is going to be an exercise in showing you the data and trying to persuade you that the micro details of how monetary policy worked at that time are particularly interesting because they go in ways that you may not anticipate. So that's where we're going. Uh, lots of literature. Let me push forward because we don't have that much time. Um, where do we get the data? Remember, we're talking about small business loans, loans below one million in size. Uh, the Community Reinvestment Act uh, essentially requires banks to disclose where they lend. And typically, uh, the, um, uh, what this means is you know uh, how much a bank lends to specific counties across the United States. Um, so we know where the borrower is, which county the borrower is, and the size of the loans that are made uh, to that particular county by a bank. Um, this covers all banks with total assets above $1 billion. They changed the requirement uh, through, you know, midway through our sample. Uh, we, we, we try and see if that explains anything, it doesn't. Um, Essentially, small business loans are all loans with a principal amount below one million. And we have observations from 1996 to 2016. Okay, so that's where uh, we have the data. We also know where the branches of US depository institutions are. And the first way we calculate distance is the distance from the county's centroid, the borrower's county's centroid, and the bank's closest branch. This is a first order approximation to distance. We have other ways of calculating it, which give us the same answer. We've also tried the population weighted centroid of the county of the borrower. We've also tried you know, a zero one variable. Does the bank lend outside the counties where its branches are located? That's a zero one variable. All these will get us similar answers. Okay. So um, we also supplement this. The problem with the, uh, with the data set from the Community Reinvestment Act is it doesn't tell us about the performance of specific loans. It doesn't tell us about the interest rates associated with specific loans. It doesn't tell us about the collateralization of those loans. The SBA does tell us about specific loans. And so we use the SBA data set of government guaranteed loans uh, which gives us information about when the loan was originated, the borrower, and who the bank lender is, and uh, allows us to calculate distance differently. Uh, that sample covers 2000 to 2016. Uh, what is useful is it gives us information about defaults, basically charge-offs, and it also tells us something about the interest rates charged on those loans. Uh, as well as the collateralization, both of which will come in use later in the talk. So here's the basic fact. Uh, what we have here is the average lending distance. Uh, 
and we can calculate median lending distance. We can do it uh, value weighted. We can uh, uh, do it numbers weighted. I mean, all of them give you the similar pattern that lending distance goes up just before the financial crisis and comes down after. It's also a small bump around 2000, which is again, a, a, a business cycle to some extent, but the really big change is before and after the financial crisis. So this is the pattern, the interesting pattern in the increase in lending distance. And we wanna try and explain this because this is also correlated with defaults. Um, okay, um, you can also look, as I said, you can look at other you know, measures. For example, um, I code a distance as one if the borrower is outside the county of my branch network, as zero if it's within the county. And again, uh, such a crude zero one measure also gives me the same pattern of an increase in lending distance before the financial crisis and a drop after. Okay, um, now obviously I wanna correct for a bunch of things because these patterns may hide a lot. So uh, what I do is I look at the change in uh, lending uh, to uh, a county C by bank B at time T. Um, and I include on the right-hand side, so that's the left-hand side, the change in the quantum of loans. On the right-hand side, I have a county time dummy. This is to account for any demand effects from that county uh, at that particular time. I also have bank fixed effects. And finally, I estimate uh, the coefficient of the distance of the closest branch, uh, 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 the closest bank branch. So I wanted to estimate what uh, the coefficient estimate is on distance. That's, uh, um, um, that's, that's the first coefficient I'm interested in. But what is more important is I wanna see how this coefficient estimate varies over the business cycle. And so what I have is business cycle variables uh, also on the right-hand side, the detrended change in real GDP, the log difference in US unemployment rate, as well as a standardized net percentage of loan officers tightening standards. This is more uh, a reflection of financial conditions. This is obviously a business cycle as is real GDP. And then on the right-hand side, I have other bank specific variables, which may vary over time, such as the bank size, as well as the shares of different loans. So essentially, I want to ask, does the, do the loans into a county from a more distant bank increase over the business cycle? That's what a, a positive beta is gonna tell me uh, if the um, business cycle variable is log GDP. And uh, that's what, uh, let me skip past the summary statistics, it's there in your paper, but that's, that's essentially what I see. Uh, when the left-hand side variable is a change in the volume of loans, the right-hand side variable is log of distance of a bank from that particular county, and I have distance times real GDP, it turns out the, uh, you know, uh, the obvious point is that the further the county is away from the bank's branching network, the fewer the growth, in, the lower the growth in loans. But if it is before a business, uh, if it is as the business cycle is booming, uh, the bank tends to make much more relatively in terms of distant loans. So it is lending at a greater distance. This is verifying that pattern that I put up for you. Of course, with the unemployment rate, we'd expect the opposite coefficient. That's what we get on the interaction variable as we do with spreads. So this is the basic fact that I want to try and explain, okay? Um, what we can also do is, is just estimate the coefficient on distance year by year and show that the no, uh, you know, there's nothing hidden here. When we estimate those coefficients year by year, it turns out they're generally negative, but they tend to become close to zero uh, 
uh, closer to um, you know a business cycle peak. And in fact, just before the financial crisis, they were positive. I was lending more. I had more loan growth at a distance uh, than I had to proximate loans. And of course, it collapses after uh, 2007, 2008. Okay, so those are the facts. By the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, and I can't see you, so you'll have to speak up if you want me to stop. Uh, but I'll go on till somebody speaks up. Okay. We can reestablish these facts uh, using other measures of distance. Uh, the regression uh, works out if I use the proportion out of the county. Uh, I can use other specifications. Uh, you know, this is not driven by any one state. Uh, this is not driven by some sparsely um, sort of uh, featured counties. I can require a minimum number of loans to a county. I can also take care of bank mergers and acquisitions by going back in time and treating any, um, any uh, bank branch as part of the eventual uh, sort of uh, uh, network that was created over time so that uh, I essentially keep the branch network constant, even if acquisitions take place over time. Uh, that might change the distance, but I, I can sort of reverse engineer the, the overall bank network and doesn't change uh, anything uh, significantly. And also we can uh, see that this works for various bank sizes. It's not just the small banks or the banks located within county uh, for which this happens. This happens for big banks, uh, as well as small banks. We well, can also, John, sorry, a, John. A quick question about the, uh, the data. Can you, you distinct, you can distinguish between different states, different parts of the country, different, also different types of banks, right? Uh, yes, I have so, bank by bank data uh, for every county in the United States, what loans they make. Uh, many of them are zero, of course, but I, I do know uh, how many small business loans it makes into a specific county. So the question is, that, does it vary across the states? Um, the sun not indicate that hump? Uh, do some of the states, well, we've done it crudely by dropping one state at a time. So one state is not driving it. Okay. Is there some portion of the states, have I looked at the 50, different plots and the answer is no, okay. but, but we can look at that. I don't think that's what's driving it, but, but it is a good question. Okay. I was just trying to think whether the county fixed effects would help there, but it wouldn't because uh, the county fixed effects would take care of the state fixed effects, but it wouldn't tell us anything about the state times time fixed effect, which is what you want, right? So, so uh, it wouldn't tell us the relationship over time, yeah. Um, okay, we also do it, you know, is this some industry effect? And so we picked an unlikely industry, agricultural loans. This is an industry which presumably doesn't move up and down with the business cycle. So anything we find is more likely to be from the supply of credit rather than demand for credit. And here we do see a similar pattern. Uh, again, a peak and a trough in the early 2000s. But again, a peak and a trough before the financial crisis, before and after the financial crisis. So if you look at small farm lending, where you don't believe there are as many uh, sort of demand side effects, you see something similar in the distance. Uh, of course, this is an industry where loans are closer. The average distance here is much closer than the average distance for the business loans that I showed earlier but you see a similar pattern. Okay, um, so the next question is, you know, does this have any effect? If all you saw was they made these loans and they were good loans and, you know, it didn't affect their business, you won't worry too much. But it turns out uh, these loans are somewhat problematic. Uh, we turn for this to the SPA data set where we have data on charge-offs. And it turns out the patterns in distance are similar in the SPA data set. So I won't bore you by showing them again. Uh, but what's interesting there is the charge offs change. So what we have on the x-axis here is the distance in miles 
of the borrower from the bank. And on the y-axis, we have the probability of charge-offs, essentially the average charge-offs of the loans that were made. And what you see, these are for different time periods. Sebastian, you have a question. Yeah, I do. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Raghu. Um, how should I think of these, these loans? These are small business loans. I keep thinking of large loans, but I know I'm, I'm wrong. The banks make these loans. What do they do with them? Do they keep them in their books? Do they package them and sell them out? Um, uh, what, what happens with these loans? These are largely uh, loans that stayed on the books. Uh, they are not packaged and sold out, especially the small business administration loans are basically staying on their books. Uh, so yes, they don't they don't package them. But the fact that there are some that don't stay and that they're packaged, would that make a difference? Did you guys look into that? Uh, that could. We we don't have data on that because we don't see the performance on the stuff that was sold, sold off their books. This is okay. stuff that stayed on the books. Okay, thanks. Uh, so what you see, and that's a good question because uh, I mean it, it was a really important question for mortgages, right? Because a whole lot was packaged and sold, and that was the worst quality. So in a sense, if you think that during this time what was packaged and sold was the worst quality, this is telling you that what stayed on was also pretty bad. Uh, and so what what was sold off, if any. Would have looked even worse. But let me show you that, uh, you know, what I mean by pretty bad. Charge offs in 2001 don't really vary with distance and are about, you know, 12, 15%. That's sort of the norm for small business lending, uh, at least at this time. What you see in 2003 is you start seeing some slight relationship with distance, but it's still relatively low. In 2005, you see a much bigger sort of charge off rate with distance, 25% uh, charge off rate for really proximate loans and close to 40% charge off rate. 40% of the loans you're making are charged off. Uh, and then you go to 2007. Now, I mean, there's something obviously somewhat selected in this in the sense that you know, the closer you get to a financial crisis, which was as deep and, and, and terrible as the one we saw, obviously the more loans are gonna go bad. So the interesting thing is not as much the level, which is gonna get worse and worse as you get closer to the financial crisis, but the slope that, you know, the charge-offs are increasing significantly more with distance. And, uh, you know, just close to the financial crisis, the charge-off rate for the really distant loans uh, which is the bottom chart on the left. By the way, you're seeing the hand that I'm uh, waving around here or you yes. don't see the hand? Yes. You do we see see the hand. So you see we the charge-off rate here is close to 50%. That's a huge charge-off rate for loans that were made just before the financial crisis and it's highest for the most distant loans. And then post-financial crisis, they pull back tremendously. And the charge-off rate again goes back to a flat uh, over distance, they're compensating, they're making careful loans at a distance, and the charge off rate is 5% when you go to 2011. Uh, uh, okay, so that's first. Charge off rates are higher with distance. That's the first thing I wanna show you. And you can show this again through re a regression. On the left-hand side is one, if the loan is charged off, and we essentially estimate this regression with different slopes for different years. And you see in the years closer to the financial crisis, you see a significant increase in the charge off rate with distance. Loans that are made at a much greater distance get, to get charged off much more. The beta uh, of the estimate is, is much higher. And after the financial crisis, it goes back down to zero consistent with the charts that I just showed, okay? Um, now, are these loans different in some sense, right? Are they more secured loans? So remember, charge-off is a probability. What is the loss given default? And we actually have data on the loss given default. And it turns out, unlike the charge-offs, the loss given default is pretty flat. It's pretty much the same every year uh, a little movement upwards closer to the financial crisis and a movement downwards as you depart from the financial crisis. 
But what is interesting, it's, it's relatively flat over distance. So you're recovering the same when the loan is charged off or goes into default. But of course, that means since the probability of default is much higher for the distant loan, the loss uh, you're making in expectation terms. So probability of default higher, loss given default the same, the loss you're making in expectation terms is much higher on the more distant loans, okay? So these are bad loans. That's, that's essentially what I'm trying to establish, uh, the loans that were made before the crisis. And obviously the finance uh, uh, or the economist in you will be asking, are they compensated for it? Do they get higher interest rates when they make these loans? And what we have here is actually the interest rate. And again, we interacted with distance and year. If they were getting compensated, we should see before the financial crisis, as you make more distant loans, you get a much higher interest rate. The coefficient of distance should be strongly positive. What you see is in the three years before the financial crisis, when they made their worst loans, they actually are risking a negative compensation for distance. They're not really charging an appropriate interest rate. And that tells me these were bad loans from the bank's perspective because they didn't earn any additional compensation for the risk they were taking. It turns out eventually they start demanding more compensation for distance loans. But this looks like, you know, post financial crisis, it looks like they're closing the stable door after the horse is bolted. They see these are risky loans, they're asking more for more compensation. Remember, we also saw the charge offs were relatively low. Right now, they're asking for compensation when they shouldn't be because they're making reasonable loans. Here they weren't, but they didn't get the compensation at that time. Okay, so uh, the last point before we try and explain it is uh, cyclical distance and loan market concentration. So we have measures of the concentration of the loan market. Later, we'll come to the concentration of deposit markets. They're similar. Um, but what we find is that the distance measure tends to uh, you know, uh, become more pronounced for loans that were made where the market, the banking market, uh, where the loan was originated is more comparative. So if the banking market is more comparative, you tend to stretch out for a, uh, at a distance and then come down. On the other hand, in banking markets that had high Huffindel index, that is large, more concentrated markets, you basically see no stretching for distance, right? So in the, um, um, so that, that, that you don't see anything where the origin was, was a very concentrated market. You see it all in, in the banking markets that were more comparative uh, where the loan is originated. And again, uh, you can see that uh, this is the origin market when the origin is more concentrated. So the Huffindel index is positive and high. You see less of an effect of distance. On the other hand, where it's comparative and the Huffindel index is, uh, is low, uh, this is, is not very negative. And so you see more of an effect on distance. And flip, vice versa, it is with the destination market. When the uh, loans into more concentrated destination markets come from a greater distance. So the bottom line I want you to take away from this is there is a particular pattern of this lending. It is going from banking markets that are very competitive within the United States, counties where banking markets are very competitive and going into counties where the banking market is not com competitive, where it is concentrated, right? And this is puzzling. Why is that happening? And why is it happening just as the Fed is raising interest rates? Because the key years where this is happening is 2004, 2005, 2006, uh, years when the Fed was raising interest rates, okay? Last point, and this is just to, you know, nail the, uh, the point that I just made, take two counties and let's look at the flows between them, right? 
from uh, uh, loans originating from them or loans going into them. And let's, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's um, estimate the HHI share of uh, that pair as HHI of county one, the Herfindel index of county one. And remember, we're talking about loan market concentration and uh, divided by the Herfindel index of county one plus the Herfindel index of county two. So uh, let's just focus on this one because the point is the uh, uh, point should be clear from just this. Supposing the HHI share is zero, so this this number is zero. It means county one is very competitive relative to county two. Okay, and and if county one is very competitive relative to county two, what we should say see is the bulk of loans originate from county one and go into county two, okay? That's how we should see the pair behave. That's exactly what we see. Here on the x-axis, I've plotted the HHI share. And on the y-axis, I've plotted in yellow county pairs where there's only outflow as well as the size of those outflows. And what you see is the lower the HHI share, that is county one is really competitive, relative to county two, you have huge outflows, okay? And as the HHI share increases, those outflows come down. Vice versa, as the HHI share increases, you have huge inflows for counties which have an HHI share of one. That means the county two is very concentrated relative to county one, and you have huge inflows into those counties, okay? So the, the flows, are essentially what I told you, it's going from comparative counties to concentrated counties. Steve. So you've shown us that um, there's this um, flow out of more competitive counties in other counties. It happens at a certain stage in the business cycle, or at least a certain time period. Do you want us to take that as a metaphor for a, a more general phenomenon? Um, or is it really a spatial phenomenon that you think is at work here? Because you could imagine, even though it might be much harder to measure, that um, markets are competitive for lending to certain industries. Uh, and then in certain time periods under certain credit conditions, banks that were concentrated in those industries would begin to lend more to industries outside their normal area of expertise. So I just, how do you want us to, is it, you think you're, you're identifying a, a broader phenomenon here, or is it really the spatial component? Uh, it's, away? I, I want to say it's it's the temporal component, and that has to do with uh, with monetary policy in a, in a second. I'll come to that. But uh, um, is it specific industries? Uh, no, I don't think so. And um, you know, remember. Uh, we, we've tried it with industries and it, it, it's not, we, we well, put in industry I, dummies, it's not I, specific industries, I, but I, yeah. yeah that, my, me, my choice of industry isn't a great one. I'm just groping here. You might imagine that um, yeah. maybe in cer certain age, firms of certain types, not well, well yeah. captured by industries. I mean, you've got this spatial dimension, which is great because we can measure it. There's a sense of, you know, what closeness looks like. We can right. measure concentration in space, but you could imagine this phenomenon occurring on multiple dimensions. I, I agree. Uh, what I want to show you is, I mean, so uh, what I want to bring next is, is, is an idea of why this might be happening when it happens. Because what's interesting is this sort of takes off in four, five, six, right? So you want to ask what in 2004, five and six caused this if, if there is something and can we sort of tie it more closely to what caused it, right? And, and that's what I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna argue just, you know, I, I showed you that agriculture slide, you know, specific to, specifically to try and address your, you know, the point which you, um, you know, uh, offered as an example, could this be certain industries? I, I wanna say it's not so much the demand side as the supply side, it's, it's these banks which have a problem. Uh, as opposed to the industries they're borrowing from. And, and let me tell you the, the, the quote unquote theory behind that. And then 
I'll give you more evidence. And then you'll see if the package sort of hangs together. But, but right now, what I want you to do is just note that there's this interesting phenomenon, and I'm going to try and explain it just now. Uh, and then we'll, I mean, the, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll have more questions after that. Happy to answer them at that point. All right, so here is uh, my cue to find explanations. And the, the obvious one is, is it, uh, uh, you know, um, the low uh, cost of, uh, of financing of, of credit? And the timing obviously seems to be off. And this is Ben Bernanke's point. Just as we were raising interest rates, everything started taking off. Why did that happen? And, uh, you know, you look at the average interest expense of these banks, uh, it's doing what we think it would do. It, it starts moving up as the Fed, it raises interest rates, and then comes down as the Fed cuts interest rates once more. Uh, you look at one-year CD rates, that's also um, going up and coming down. Um, you know, uh, the Fed seems to be transmitting interest rates, uh, maybe not uniformly, and that's the point we'll come to in a second, but certainly this is happening at a time the Fed is raising interest rates. So uh, why is that? And, um, you know, again, uh, since each bank has its own uh, interest expense rate and these varies across banks, uh, we can put that on the right-hand side. And you find that, interestingly, it's the banks that have higher interest expenses that are doing more of this. So these aren't the banks that have access to cheap credit. These aren't the banks that are splurging on cheap credit. These are actually the banks that are paying higher interest expenses or that have a higher CD rate that are stretching out on distance. That's exactly what this regression is telling you. Um, distance is more for the banks that have higher interest expenses, okay? So that's, that's the interesting phenomenon we need to talk about. Okay, so three facts, uh, distant lending from comparative to concentrated counties at a time the Fed started raising interest rates. And this is what made us think, does this have something to do with the work that Drexler, Schnabel and Savov have, right? Uh, because they too focus on competition in banking markets. And, and their argument is actually a very interesting one. Banks have varying degrees of market power in the deposit markets. And when the Fed raises interest rates, in the comparative markets, they have no ability to hold back. They have to pass through because they're all competing for deposits. And so you find a very high deposit interest expense beta, which means interest expenses move up as the Fed raises interest rates. Uh, that's the beta they're talking about. Uh, the correlation is very strong between the Fed raising interest rates and banks moving up their interest expenses. Uh, that's the first thing uh, that they argue. Uh, however, they also say in concentrated areas, uh, banks really have a choice. Um, they can uh, maybe uh, not pay as much on, uh, on deposits because they have uh, a, a more concentrated market. Of course, one of the costs of that is that uh, they risk uh, having fewer deposits come in and loan growth will be slower, but that's the price they pay for exercising their monopoly power. Essentially, they give on the quantity while taking on the price. And, and this is a very interesting uh, view. They call it the deposit channel of monetary policy, but we, we wondered if this could put, potentially explain some of what we're seeing. And, and it would work like this. And uh, uh, it would work like this. You know, in the concentrated areas, if you're not passing through the interest expenses, uh, if you're not passing through the Fed higher interest rates to your depositors, well, many of them will remain with you because they're somewhat captive, but some will will run because they want to look for the best deposit rate uh, in the country. Uh, you remember there were many uh, you know, advertisements of how you could get more if you banked at a distance, if you deposited in, what was it, wing, wing, wing nut bank, something like that. Uh, but basically some will redeposit their money in banks in comparative areas. The problem is when these deposit flows come in, the borrowers, because these are comparative 
counties to begin with are already well supplied in these areas. And what's important here is the borrowers in the same county as the depositor, uh, basically you're already well supplied in these areas. And so I have more funds in my pocket, but I don't have great lending opportunities. What do I do as a bank? Now, as economists, we would say, sit tight, just hold the money, put it in T-bills, uh, that should give you enough compensation to pay the depositors, but you don't really need to take more risk. If, however, I suffer from standard moral hazard problems, uh, I need to show that I'm as good as the bank across the street, um, I have a short-termism problem. Uh, I'm trying to compete with those guys. Uh, basically, I make loans because I generate fee income. And I show that fee income as showing how good I am relative to the bank across the street. If I throw up my hands and say, I really have no lending opportunities because uh, you know, my shareholders may not be able to see the full gamut of my opportunities, they might think, well, maybe this guy is particularly incompetent, doesn't really know how to ferret out new lending opportunities. That's why they're unprofitable relative to the bank across the street. In other words, uh, this, uh, this basic competition also at the bank level could cause me to stretch out. Um, uh, this is the kind of moral hazard that Holmstrom talked about, basically the rat race equilibrium where I'm running to stay still. Everybody's running uh, because if you stay still, uh, you basically get found out to be lazy or incompetent. And so we're all trying to make all the loans we can. So there are two right. elements to this, and, and I'll come to the question in a second. There are two elements to this. Uh, one, that is the uh, bank uh, in, the, um, in the comparative area has to pay out uh, higher uh, interest rates, otherwise it might see everything go. Uh, but as it pays out higher interest rates, it also attracts deposits from some of the other areas. So it has money burning a hole in its pocket and it lends it out. So we need to show all three pieces in order to satisfy you that that's what's going on. Uh, any questions? Uh, Arvind. So this, this, uh, this question links back to what I think Steve was asking about earlier. Um, this theory sounds generically about risk taking in which the spatial dimension is a particular example of risk-taking. Is that the way you're thinking about this? Uh, to some extent, uh, it, again, I wanna emphasize the spatial and the temporal. The risk-taking takes off at a particular time. And that's yeah. because what you're doing on the deposit side draws in flows that essentially, uh, you, know, you need to do something about it. If I, was, if I didn't suffer from moral hazard, yeah. I would just sit tight on it and deposit in T-bills, no problem. But you, you know, so you could go and, and lend to some risky project a um, hundred miles from here. The other thing you could do is just say, just write out of the money put options. R right, well, so that is, there's a whole kind of bunch of generic right. ways in which you can take risk and generate right. uh, current so, income. Yeah. So to your point, mm -hmm. I don't really want to take risk. What I want to do is generate income, okay? Mm -hmm. And if I could do it without taking risks, I'd be really happy. So this is not the risk shifting moral hazard that we usually think about. Okay. Because what it is, is I want to look good relative to the bank across the street, okay? So I want to make good loans and get fee income. The problem is in my area, it's pretty much fleshed out. All the borrowers have all the money they can get. So I go more distant looking for possible opportunities and where better than the places where they're shrinking their lending for exactly the reason I'm getting more funds. They're shrinking their lending. Let me go there and lend because there are guys they've let go. Turns out those are bad guys. Better would be to make no money. That's the problem. So uh, again, it's, again, it's, it sounds like generating fee income. Uh, and this is a particularly good way to generate current, current fee income. Um, exactly. There might be others. There might be others. And that's the, why I say this is part of a generalized risk taking. So you will see it also in the NPS these guys generate. I, I'll show you who okay. these guys are. This is not everybody in that comparative area. 
This is a subset of the banks in that comparative area who are doing the worst stuff. And they're the guys who are most liable to this kind of moral hazard. Sounds good. Alina. Hey, hi, Arago. A question about interpretation. So feel free to postpone it to later if, if more helpful. So you talk about a rat race a la Holmstrom. In fact, I was wondering whether there are adverse selection aspect to the story you're laying out, because in, if I'm really trying to impress, so to speak, my customer vis-a-vis -vis the competitor in the same street, those a la Holmstrom, those who would have the stronger incentive to do so, are those who are not necessarily the best banks. So there, are, there's a combination between signaling your type through costly action and effectively providing a service of any value to customers. Does it make sense what I'm asking? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand. Um, you're asking whether the people who will stretch out are the people who've made bad loans already? Right. So the question is, if I were to think about a more hazard story without our selection, yeah. you would think that the only the only question am I inducing the right choice of action yeah. on the part of the agent? But the Holmstrom story is that there are adverse selection and more hazard component. Nobody really knows the type of banks sure. and the incentives to jam the signal, to affect the signal. Right about my ability competence as a bank would be stronger for those who think that may be perceived to be the relatively worst bank, which in equilibrium may be actually the relatively worst banks. It, it could be, I mean, uh, I, I don't want necessarily to be there to be adverse selection. It could just be the inference uh, from a low realization of your fee income is that you're not particularly competent at, at, at finding out. Now, there may need to be some types of that kind, but what I'm saying is even normal types may be forced to run. That's the rat race equilibrium, right? Because uh, they, if they don't, if they stop, uh, they're identified as the lazy types, which is not what they want. So they run in order to be identified as normal types, even though running may, in this case, have bad, bad effects. Right, right, exactly. I was thinking about there are perverse type of outcomes in which, as you say, there should be a monotone effect. Everybody is induced to do more and better than otherwise. But I was wondering whether you worried about those outcomes in which those were the greater incentives are not the ones you may want to it, say it long could, more. It could be. I, I, I think I'd have to see the model first to understand what the incentives are for those, those bad types. Do they do more? What we do see is uh, certainly those who are subject to this kind of rat race incentive because they're publicly traded firms, for example. So remember what we're talking about is is moral hazard between the bank CEO and the shareholders. In order to convey a high stock price, I need to show high fee income. And in order to show high fee income, I got to generate those fees by making loans uh, more widely. And that's, that's the problem. Okay, Alan. Yeah, thanks. This is very uh, interesting uh, paper. Uh, I had a question about the narrative on this slide and whether there could be another mechanism. So. When you say where do flighty depositors go in this period of rising rates is there is there also an emigration of deposits into money market funds which then get relent through the shadow system to uh banks in other areas in in non-core or non-deposit funding uh, and could that be a, a sort of parallel complementary to story to what's going on here it, it could well be it could well be because you would assume the banks in competitive areas also pay higher rates on their commercial paper, et cetera. And so have, it's have not you looked just- at commercial paper and, and that side of the balance sheet? Uh, no, commercial paper is on the balance sheet. Uh, uh, I mean, we, uh, we could look at that. We haven't looked at that. I'll show you deposit growth in a second. But I think the point you're making is many of their short-term liabilities will reprice and they will get flows through that not just through deposits. You're absolutely right. That's a great point. And, uh, and, and that makes sense. It also, uh, the, the other point you're making is it could also migrate outside the banking system. That's not what we're looking at, but it could migrate outside the banking system to the shadow financial system for them to make loans. So not the uh, 
uh, to the finance companies, to the real, real estate companies, et cetera. And there's some evidence that that also happened. So, so again, I mean, to the larger point, it was not us, we were raising interest rates. Well, there's also a reallocation of flows that was taking place at this time to the detriment of overall credit quality. And that may be part of what was going on from uh, a, a modest pace of, uh, now this is, at this point I enter conjecture, I'll come back to it a little, a little later. Um, okay, so if they don't have local lending opportunities, they could simply invest the funds in treasuries, but then, you know, uh, CEO short-termism might preclude that. Jeremy Stein has a paper on investment in corporations. I have a paper on banks making basically this point. And, and so you want to show uh, that you have lots of fees. Uh, if your competitors are raking it in, you want to make these loans. And uh, it's a form of CEO versus shareholder moral hazard. There could be other forms I'll come to in a second, which we can rule out with some of our evidence. So what you see is some of this seems to be playing out. And to Alan's point, it's not just deposits which we should be looking at, but also things like commercial paper where you know, these deposit outflows. So in the most concentrated areas, deposit growth is somewhat slower than in the most competitive areas consistent with the Drexler, Savov and Schnabel idea. But you could also argue that, uh, that perhaps it's also the flows are coming in in other forms, such as through commercial paper. But, but you see, prima facie, there is a decline in the growth rate of deposits with concentration, which is consistent with the point I just made. The second point, I think this is important, is in the comparative areas, the local area seems to be played out. And to show that, I show you charge-offs. Uh, how charge-offs vary with concentration over time uh, and uh, what we find is in the most uh, comparative areas, uh, or they, they, maybe it's easier to understand with concentrated. High HHI means a concentrated area. In the most concentrated areas, the charge-offs are lower uh, with time uh, before the financial crisis, which means in the most competitive areas, the charge-offs are relatively higher, okay? So uh, that's, that's a complicated way of saying, in the competitive areas where I'm getting those funds in, it turns out my lending opportunities are less good than in those concentrated areas. So if, if I'm making the decision in real time, the credit quality of loans made in concentrated areas is better than the credit quality of loans made in comparative areas. Where do I want to make loans if I'm not interested in maximizing risk? I want to maximize fee income. So I say making local loans, I'm going to, it's already pretty you know, played out. It's, uh, there's, there are too many loans being made locally. It's getting riskier. Let me go to the other guy's place where he's actually shrinking lending. And in fact, there are still some good opportunities. Now, it turns out exposed, they weren't great opportunities because I probably got an adversely selected sample of the loans that guy was letting go of. But, you know, ex ante, it made sense to stretch for a distance. So what we see is local lending opportunities in the comparative areas look much worse than local lending opportunities in the concentrated areas. Charge-offs in the concentrated areas are lower for local loans than charge-offs in the comparative areas just before the financial crisis. So I wanna, I wanna make loans in the concentrated areas. That's where I wanna go. Um, and, and finally, uh, you know, the point, who are the banks that are stretching to lend? These are the banks whose interest expenses are going up because these are also the banks that are generating more deposit inflows. These are also the banks that are generating more commercial paper inflows. Again, focus on this. Uh, basically, uh, those that have a, a high origin interest expense beta that are raising interest rates as the Fed is raising interest rates are the guys who are attracting more inflows and are the guys that are stretching at a much greater distance just before the financial crisis. That's the positive coefficient, okay? Okay, um, let me go on. And the last point I want to establish 
is these are the banks that particularly suffer from moral hazard. Armin. Just uh, maybe you've looked at this data, but I, and you just haven't included it. Um, I was curious about your post financial crisis sample in which it looks like these effects aren't present. And I think your answer is gonna be that during this period, interest rates are low and remain low. Yep. You do have a rate hike cycle starting right at the end of your sample. Yep. Have you looked uh, at it? 2000, uh, you're talking about 2015, 16, 17, 18, that, yeah. that, that period. We haven't looked at it, no, but uh, we should, we should. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it might allow one to distinguish between sort of generic procyclicality. Right of the financial system and right. something, I think you're telling a very specific channel about interest rates and deposit flows. Right. No, it, it's, a, it's a good point. And, and, and uh, we should, um, we should. Uh, I mean, the, the flip side of it is we probably have far fewer charge-offs because nothing bad happened. You may say mm -hmm. that's the point that was different, but uh, you know, there was, uh, to some extent, uh, the Fed reacted in reversing itself in 2018 uh, when things started looking as if they were going south. So we didn't run the experiment fully. Uh, and maybe if we ran it fully, we'll have a different story. But, but even but if you right. were to see the, uh, the spatial dimension of the portfolio. Yeah. It's a good question. It's yeah. a good question. It, and it we, would be we consistent should. with what you're doing. Yeah. We should. It's uh, uh, well, absolutely. Uh, I, we, we should do it. Um, I mean, to some extent, we started this paper in 2017. It's taken us so long to do everything that we wanted to on it. So, uh, you know, time has caught up with us. Um, okay, uh, we, we can divide the banks into banks that are more prone to moral hazard than that are not. Now, I'm not saying that any of this is causal. It's just indicators suggesting that they might be more prone. So, uh, you know, Falato and Sharfstein look at public versus private banks, saying private banks are better incentivized. They don't have this need to show their shareholders they do, they're doing really well because the shareholders are pretty close to them. So public banks should suffer more from this moral hazard than private banks. We should see them stretching more. Risk controls, Elul and Yeramali have a paper which uh, indicates the level of risk controls in different banks. Banks with greater risk controls do, should do less of this than banks with weaker risk controls. Big four auditors, if you still believe the auditors contribute, uh, then big four auditors should be better than uh, small no-name auditors, and they should minimize this kind of risk taking. Now, we introduced this partly because my two co-authors are accountants and they really believe in the power of audit. So, so we'll, we'll see if this matters. It turns out it does. Uh, and finally, the percentage of CO pay in bonuses and options, uh, this uh, moral hazard, uh, you know, keeping up with the Jones moral hazard or rat race equilibrium moral hazard has a greater weight if uh, it makes a material difference to you in terms of bonuses, et cetera. You want to generate that fee income because it actually affects your bonus and you want to show you're generating that fee income. Um, and, and what you see uh, is basically all these things pan out. Uh, the publicly list listed bank stretches out more at a distance. Uh, those that have higher risk management index do less of distance lending before the crisis. Uh, the um, you know, big four auditor, again, less of that procyclicality. And finally, more bonus compensation, more procyclicality, put everything together. Uh, we've got enough observations that it actually works out. Um, we can also separate okay. this and uh, and make the point that uh, you know when you look at the lending from concentrated counties to uh, from competitive counties to concentrated counties, it's primarily done by these banks. And again, uh, what you see is again and again, it's uh, these special banks, public banks uh, with low risk management index. Uh, with non-big four auditors and uh, with high bonus payments, these are the banks which stretch more for a distance from the uh, competitive areas. That's, that's, that's who's doing this. Okay, so what are the other explanations? Now, Arvind hinted at this by saying, look, there's the standard risk-shifting moral hazard, right? Now, it's very hard to get at that because uh, basically it says when managers of banks that have limited capital 
uh, or limited uh, franchise value are going to make uh, risky loans because they benefit if the loans work out, while if, uh, if the loans create losses, they were toast anyway, so they don't lose. So the problem with that is why not make risky loans locally? We just showed that in those competitive areas, local loans were more risky than ex ante than loans made uh, to distant areas. So they should have just stuck to the knitting and made a lot more local loans and they'd have made their losses. They would be gambling. It turns out, uh, one, they don't do that. And second, when you correlate any of this riskiness with bank capital, you don't see anything. It's, it's all over the place. So um, again, there are well-known problems with, with running that kind of regression, but at least prima facie, there doesn't seem to be a correlation there. More relevant question is, is this within bank moral hazard? So I'm a loan officer uh, and I'm sitting uh, in a county where there's not that much lending going on. Uh, wouldn't I sort of say, I risk losing my job if I don't uh, pick up because across the country, I can see loans being made. Everybody seems to be finding loan opportunities. Why am I not finding loan opportunities? Aren't my bank manager is going to fire me if I don't make loans. Well, that's a possibility. It turns out, well, first, you know, CEOs or, you know, my supervisor can see what loans I'm making and whether I'm really stretching. And if they don't like it, they can stop me. So it can't be really that. It turns out we see similar effects if you have a bank which is entirely located in a county. So it's a small bank entirely located in a county. The CEO sits in the same office as a loan officer. Even those banks, if they're in comparative areas, are stretching. So it doesn't seem that I'm doing something which my managers don't know about. It's sort of uh, low manager versus high manager moral hazard. It seems like there's a fair amount of, uh, of monitoring that's going on. What is more important, and this is the clincher here, if you look at banks diversified across areas. So think of a bank with a branch in a comparative area, and a branch in a concentrated area, okay? Now, the bank can make local loans both in the comparative area and in the concentrated area, but it's getting more deposits in the comparative area. What it should do is recycle those flows into the branch, which is in a concentrated area, and make those loans. In our sample, it would show up as local loans. It wouldn't show up as distant loans because they're recycling the loans within their network. Put differently, when you look at banks that are diversified across areas, they shouldn't be subject to this distance moral hazard, unlike banks that are uh, not so well diversified. It turns out that's the case. Look at banks which have a small coefficient of variation in HHI. In other words, there's not much variance in the concentration amongst the places they're in. And most of the places they're in are in com are comparative areas. So the average is small. These are the guys that stretch out to lend at a distance. So I'm not diversified across areas and I'm in largely comparative areas. I stretch out to lend at a distance. What if I'm diversified uh, across areas? I don't really see much of a distance uh, loan here. And what if I'm not diversified, but most of the areas I am in are concentrated areas? That's this guy in blue. That guy, you see even less of an effect of distance. Put differently, it's the guys who are in competitive areas who are largely in competitive areas who stretch out for, dis at, for, for distance lending. The other guys don't. And that's consistent with this notion that, uh, that this is some kind of a... Uh, bank shareholder moral hazard. So why care about small business lending? And uh, last couple of slides, then I'll stop. Uh, well, you know, if it was just small business lending, uh, not particularly interesting, but certainly as an example of the interaction between monetary policy and incentives, uh, more interesting. What is particularly interesting is that banks that are stretching out in the small loans, and this is to Arvind's point, are doing other crazy stuff also. So the broad increase in, 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 in bad stuff is going on in these banks, not just stretching out. 
And that might suggest the fundamental driver to some extent may be something about competition uh, more broadly at a time that rates are going up. It turns out if you separate these banks on banks with higher overall NPAs, not just in small business lending, but overall, and see if they were likely to experience pro-cyclical pro uh, distance lending, turns out those are in fact the banks that stretch out for a distance. These are the banks that had a higher NPAs uh, over the period 07 to 09, while the banks with no, uh, with uh, much lower NPAs, you don't see the distance lending. So this is to Arvind's point that maybe other stuff is going on. What is interesting is we pick this up in a particular area and we sort of can isolate who these banks are in both from the moral hazard perspective, but also the location of the deposit taking. So uh, by the way, we can do this also with other measures of systemic risk, you know, banks that tended to lose a lot at the same time that the market uh, lost value uh, tend to also be these kinds of uh, these banks that are stretching. So banks that have a systemic risk component are the banks uh, that are all stretching on distance. This is not isolated to small business lending. So, you know, risky distant lending is accompanied, uh, dis accompanied monetary policy tightening. Now, two points here. One, this may be reminiscent of the Latin American debt crisis. For those of you who remember, and Alan obviously remembers it, this was when um, you know, the um, oil deposits were recycled by the banks uh, into Latin American loans, right? And remember the argument then was similar. We've got all this money flowing into our, our coffers. We don't quite know what to do it, with it. Let's look for lending opportunities. And they lent to all these Latin American countries and then had the big bust in the eighties. This is a similar phenomenon money burning a hole in your pocket and you you need to do something with it otherwise you know throw up your hands and uh, and everybody comments on why you're not doing similar business or in the infamous words uh, of chuck prince uh, you know the music's playing and we have to keep dancing uh, and you know i once met him at a conference and i asked him why did you say that and he said look the problem was a lot of you know, my organization was, it, it was not just the shareholders, it was my organization. Uh, they were seeing people across the street do deals. And so if I stopped doing deals, I'd suddenly lose a lot of my investment banking guys because they'd say, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not participating. Uh, let me go to Credit Suisse and do this stuff. So just to keep my organization together, uh, you know, while the music's playing, I still had to keep dancing. There's a version of that going on here. Uh, the bank across the street is playing and I have to keep playing. Otherwise, you know, bad things happen. Uh, now, you know, to John Taylor's point, does it imply that all monetary tightening will have similar effects? And I think his point was, when you don't tighten fast enough, what happens is there's the seeming presence of alternative lending opportunities. So these guys are seeing flows coming in, but they're seeing the potential for lending still. And so they go out and lend. What if the pace of tightening had been faster? And of course, we don't know what exactly would have happened, but one possibility is across the board, if lending opportunities seem to come down, there won't be this incentive to essentially compete with the Jones by making loans. Uh, you might all argue that, look, you know, this is a new environment the Fed has created and tightened lending across the board. And so it is possible. Again, our data cannot go there for obvious reasons, but it is possible uh, a less than measured pace of tightening uh, might have created a different outcome. It could have precipitated a, a, a severe recession also, where we should keep that in mind, but it may have precluded some of this risky uh, lending. And finally, uh, to the question that some of you might have, uh, could small business lending, and this is, I think, Arvind's point, can you show it happening elsewhere? We showed it a little bit in 2000, but can we show it in 2015, 16, 17, so we could pay attention to this? Well, the problem with paying attention to this for supervisory uh, reasons is that uh, 
you know, we have good health law. As soon as the supervisors start looking at this, banks will become cagey and, uh, and find ways to not, uh, not go down this path. It may well be that we also learned lessons from what happened in 2000, 2009. And you can see post financial crisis, they tightened up on distance, perhaps excessively. Uh, and, uh, and maybe it's been enough years that those loan officers are no longer in the lending business. We have a whole new crop and it's time for them to learn the lesson all over again. That's, that's basically what I had. Thank you, Raghu. I have a, just a quick question about the, the fact that interest rates increased, but maybe they'd increase enough. And how do you, I, I have various ways to measure how much is enough. And yeah. by those measures, it wasn't enough. So the direction is right, but the magnitudes are off. Is that, do you have anything? I'm, 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 I'm happy with that interpretation because uh, what you're saying is, um, or let, let me put it in terms of my model. If the pace of increase had been high enough to uh, make lending less attractive across the board, then the kind of moral hazard I'm talking about, the guy across the street is lending. Well, if it's clear that he's making bad loans, because really at these high interest rates, uh, it doesn't make sense to lend in, in such large quantities to borrowers, then the kind of moral hazard I'm talking about would, would attenuate. And, and basically banks would say, look, we've got money uh, maybe coming in from other areas. Let's just put it in treasury bills and be happy with it because we really uh, should not be making loans at this time. What we had instead was a climate where if the Fed was behind the curve, as you suggest, the general belief was that lending was still attractive. Uh, these were profitable loans and that put pressure on the guys who weren't making it to make more loans. So to your broader point, maybe um, you know, an increase in rates strong enough to quell activity would have actually also improved the quality of credit at that time. And that is something I could, I could well buy and extrapolate uh, with you know, moderate confidence from this model. This may be one of the question is the international side. You can, you can think about banks lending abroad instead of far away. It is like a distance measure. Is that, and there was a lot of extra lending abroad too. So is that something that you, should think be considered. Other people should consider what you're feeling about. That well, there are there are papers on that, um, uh, which which establish something similar, right? A stretch for distance before the financial crisis, and a retrenchment uh, after. Uh, that doesn't have the um, the details uh, right. because it's obviously subject to different monetary policies, different exchange rates, etc. Uh, what we can do within this is, is really keep all that uh, constant. Uh, Everybody is subject to the same monetary policy. It's just competition varies. The broader point I want to, uh, I want to make with this is, is, you know, competition between banks is a factor we, we often sort of uh, pay less attention to, but may be a driver of uh, some of the phenomena that we see. Steve. Um, when I think about the particular moral hazard problem that you've emphasized, and I ask myself where, what other settings might might it show up? I suppose there are many, but it's got to be a it's got to be an area where you do deals, and down the line things can turn out bad, and that that's kind of and the first that comes to my mind is private equity buyouts, where you could imagine a similar moral hazard. Um, story at work. And I'm just wondering, do we see evidence of that? Or, or are you aware of evidence that the same kind of dynamic uh, can play out? And I don't mean with respect necessarily to, to distance here, but yep. just the nature of the moral hazard problem that you've, that you've described here. Do we, do we see that in other, other settings? Do you think it's important in other settings or it's peculiar to commercial banking? Well, I think you see the elements of that. We, we have to work it through a cycle and see what happened. I mean, somebody should do the study for what happened with private equity. We know there were some pretty big disasters. Uh, some of them rescued by appropriate renegotiation with the bondholders who were even uh, 
you know, who, were, who had not been careful about the appropriate covenants and protections uh, so that they bore a big hit at, at the time post global financial crisis. Even today, you talk to private equity people and, uh, you know, they're scared at the prices that are being paid but the guy across the street is paying them and has raised plentiful funds, so you can't back off. Uh, and even, I mean, I, I, I talked to some fairly conservative uh, uh, private equity investors and they're saying, we hate these prices. We think, you know, we, we don't really believe they're here to stay, but we have no option but to do deals at this price because we've raised the money, we can't sit on it. So it's, it's really actually in some ways even more than, uh, uh, than the banks because they don't have the option of putting it in treasuries and saying, be happy, it's earning a sufficient return. They were not paid to put it in treasuries. And so this is, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Private equity is, is this kind of phenomenon in spades. So let me just, I have, a, I have not thought about it this way before, but I, I have a current working paper with Josh Lerner, John Haltwinger and others in which um, one of the central findings is that private equity buyout deals that are um, um, executed in tight credit market conditions have much better productivity performance afterwards. So we're measuring, you know, we're trying to measure some kind of operational efficiencies. I'm, I'm not sure that maps exactly into your story, but there is a very there, we do have very strong evidence of cyclicality and the quality of the deals that get executed, not from a financial return perspective, which I think others have focused on, but from an operational efficiency perspective. Um, maybe that's maybe that's your moral hazard problem in play. I'm not sure. I, well, I mean, I let me try. I mean, I think that would be consistent because the the really good deals are where you make a difference, right? The private equity deals where you can make a difference to the underlying operations and uh as you know um the market gets easier the credit market gets more accommodating uh you've done all the deals where you can make a big difference and then you go to deals where you can make a small difference and no difference and right. so that would account for productivity differences over time right that's that's what we see we see that that pattern pretty strongly in the u.s over the past 30 years or so yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's fascinating. I, I think that's perfectly consistent. Um, Lina, yeah. yeah, last question. Yeah, Thank you. Question. I was curious, Raghu, about your view on current regulatory policy. What I mean is that we know that there's huge dispersion in the degree of concentration of the banking industry. There are locations and areas in the U.S. where there's huge concentrations, areas, more rural ones, where there isn't. And the argument I often is advanced is that there are local needs that certain banks, redlining history, satisfy better than others. Um, what do you think? What, what would be or should be the policy going forward? Did we do anything that should have been done better? You know, I think there are people, uh, I haven't thought about it deeply, sorry. Uh, I, I don't know what the appropriate policy is. Uh, I, I, I mean, what I can say from this uh, from this study is really, uh, you know, competition has has you know some downsides. Obviously, we know competition has upsides, and uh, and you know how that plays out is obviously we need we need more more analysis. I I haven't looked at uh, at that issue uh, to be frank. Uh, you know, I I do. Um, you know, I have experienced bad service from banks and I would love to have more competition to my current banker, but I, I don't think that's a basis for making policy. So I would, uh, let me let me shut up and anybody else who has more knowledge about this, happy to let them. I think, I think we're out of time. Raghu, thank you so much. This is terrific. Learned a lot. So please come thank back. You. Thanks.